This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. In the name of the one who has knit us together, bound us together as a family of faith, dear brothers and sisters. Families can be funny things. Families can have some very unique dynamics. The word family comes from the word familiar. So these are the people who are familiar to you, most familiar, and closest to you. But families can be funny things, can't they be? You know, families can bring a lot of blessings. You have people who resemble each other, who live together. Families who have likes and dislikes that are often very similar with food or activities that they like to do. You have people who are sharing close quarters with each other, meals with each other, time with each other, people that are supporting each other. Wonderful. But families can have some interesting days, too. There are family times where familiarity breeds contempt. Sometimes those close quarters cause a little bit of competition or some irritability. There are some times where the devil can stir up some contention and some fights in the family. Maybe you remember some times in in your own family where things weren't going so well. There's days where people aren't always cherishing their family. Today, the Apostle Paul speaks about that concept. As we said before, he's going to talk to us today about family, about the family of faith, some of whom are in your family, but also in an extended family as well. Are families of faith funny things too? They they can be. They're supposed to be cherished, but there are some days where they can exhibit some of the negative things that we see in, in family units as well. So let's learn about what Paul says here about the family of faith, and let's be encouraged to cherish the family of faith. Paul's going to tell us, first of all, to look back with thankfulness on it, and then to move forward together. Paul said this in verse 3, I thank God whom I serve as my forefathers did with a clear conscience as night and day I constantly remember you, Timothy, in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Paul looked back with a bit of emotion. Do you feel some emotion in those, those words? I think we see some emotion there, especially since this is Second Timothy. Our readings in the weeks leading up to today have all been from First Timothy. This is Second Timothy. Those books were written at different times in a different context. When First Timothy was written, Paul was in prison in Rome, but it really wasn't a, a dire situation. He expressed the, the, the thought that he probably was going to be released, the hope that he could make a trip to Spain. He was under house arrest, and so he could have visitors that that came and went. But it really wasn't a a dire, dire situation as he wrote. 2 Timothy is at a later time, and Paul's in prison in Rome again. But this time it doesn't seem he's going to be released. In fact, by his words and by his tone, he feels that uh, his life is at stake and he might be martyred soon for the faith. And as Paul waxes a bit nostalgic, he's not really uh, allowed too much. He didn't even have time to grab his coat, he says, or his parchments when uh, he was seized and and arrested a second time in a persecution of the church. And he looks back with reminiscing on the family of faith. The first one he mentions here are his forefathers. The the forefathers who have gone before him, who worship the Lord like him. His, His thoughts drift to them, and his thoughts drift to to young Pastor Timothy. I've mentioned a couple times that uh, Timothy, in these readings we've been looking at, was a young pastor who had been mentored by older missionary Paul. Paul had trained Timothy, and they were very close. Have you ever mentored someone? Have you ever trained someone at work, and you spent a little extra time with them and worked with them, and and you got a little bit close to them? If so, you can probably imagine the, the close bond that Paul and Timothy shared. They had met in a town in Asia Minor called Lystra. It was on Paul's first missionary trip up through there. And Timothy was a classic example 
of an Old Testament faith becoming a New Testament faith. What that means is Paul would go to the synagogue when he came to town and he would preach about the, those prophecies in the Old Testament, about the Messiah. The Messiah was coming. The Savior's coming. He's going to deliver us. And, and all those prophecies had pointed ahead. And then he led those people into Jesus Christ, who came as that fulfillment, who was the Messiah, who had completed our salvation. And Timothy had believed. Not only that, but Timothy had felt so strongly about this that he resolved to become a young pastor. As Paul looks back on their relationship, there are very vivid words in this reading. I recall your tears. Probably when they parted for the last time. I long to see you. You are in my prayers night and day. I have a recollection of your faith. And later in the book, he's going to tell him, come and see me. There was an emotional tie that they had as Paul treasured their, their relationship and the family of faith. So much so that he even talked about his mother and grandmother. He remembered Lois. And he remembered Eunice, who had raised Timothy in that faith of the Old Testament, the faith of the Lord looking ahead to that Messiah. We, we never hear about Timothy's father. It appears he might have been a Gentile and uh, wasn't involved in, in the training of, of Timothy. But Lois and Eunice, uh, dear women that Paul remembered. Paul treasured the family of faith as he looked back with thankfulness. It's a good place to pause for us to look back a bit. Do you have people gone before you that you treasure and cherish? You know, I'm going to uh, put some pictures up in my office. For some reason, I don't know, that just keeps getting pushed back and back with uh, transition times. But uh, among my pictures, as I, as I get them out, I, I have a couple that are kind of special to me. I uh, have my class at the seminary from the early 90s, special to me, of course. I haven't seen some of those people since graduation. And uh, also along the way, I got a copy of my dad's seminary graduating class, 1963. And along the way, I also got a copy of uh, my grandpa's graduating class, which, uh, 1934 from the seminary. First class to go all the way through the new building in Mequon, Wisconsin, that had just been, been built. I also ran across uh, my grandpa's brother's graduating class from 1937. So I made a copy of that, too. He's my great uncle. You know, those portraits are, are special to me. They're special to me as I look back. Special to me because of the heritage, you know, that God has given me not only in believers who have gone before me, but also in pastors who have gone before me. And special and, and unique. I also think of my family unit growing up. Me and my two sisters uh, growing up in the household. My parents were always active in church, and they, they took us to every church service that we had. Uh, Lenten Wednesdays and Thanksgivings and New Year's Eve and, and all of them. Active in our church and serving to make it a better place. They sent us to the Lutheran grade school that our church operated. They uh, also sent us kids to Martin Luther Prep School. I uh, wanted us to continue our Lutheran and Christian education there. It means a lot looking back, treasuring what they, they gave us and, and passed on to us. I know my wife's family. It's, it's the same for her, and she can look back on memories I don't even know. Her and her two brothers who went to Emmanuel Lutheran in Tempe, Arizona for years. Parents are very active. Dad served on the council. Mom was secretary and many church services. They went through the Lutheran grade school there. And they could have gone to Chandler High School and, and would have worked out probably just fine for their high school education. But her parents wanted them to commute an hour to uh, Arizona Lutheran Academy to continue with their education there. Looking back with memories and really, really cherishing what has gone before us and what was passed on. I know some of you can do the same. Do you have forefathers that you can look back on with thanks? Do you have Sunday school teachers that you remember teaching you in a little class, teaching you those Bible accounts of, of Noah and of Abraham and of Jesus? Pastors that had a catechism class with you and led you through all of that. Maybe you got a little close to them in class and they confirmed you in, in the faith. Maybe some members in our church who, who were leaders, inspirational people, people that lifted you up and inspired you. Look back with thanks. Cherish the family of faith that God has given. 
But Paul doesn't just do that today. Paul also then talks about the future and what should happen now. And he looks forward because we shouldn't really live in the past. Someone who drives down the freeway just looking in the rearview mirror might run into some problems. We don't live in the past, but as Paul did, he looked to the future by mentioning three things that Timothy should remember. The first one was in verse 6 where he said, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Fan into flame your gift. Use your gift. It literally is the word to fan into flame, to blow on a flame or to, to use bellows. You know what happens when you do that. The embers get red. Maybe a flame bursts up. Do that with your special gift. We don't know what the gift was. Paul doesn't mention it. But it came through the laying on of his hands. That's still done when pastors are ordained. Pastors are installed. There'll be other ministers that lay their hands on them and speak words of blessing and prayer over them. Paul knew that Timothy had gotten a special gift and should use it. Paul also says a second thing. He said in verse 7, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Have no shame. Don't be ashamed. It appears Timothy was a bit of a timid soul. We hear a couple encouragements of Paul like that in the New Testament. He did say once to him in, in 1 Timothy, Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Don't be ashamed, Timothy. Be bold. Speak up. And don't be ashamed of me, especially because I'm in prison. And then a third thing he tells Timothy is in verse 8, <clears throat> Join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Paul says, be prepared to face suffering. It was going to come. It had come to Paul. He was now in jail. And it would come to Timothy if he was going to be a faithful preacher of God's word too. But Paul doesn't just lay this out there and say, just do it. Just, just face it. He gives a reason for him to do it, and a motivation. And the reason is what Christ has done. It was because of the plan of Christ that had been in effect for a long time. Paul mentioned that God had loved him before the beginning of time, that he had appeared and fulfilled God's prophecies as the Savior of the world, and that he also had destroyed death and brought immortality. That's an interesting word for, for destroy, worth mentioning. The word literally means to bring something to a stop. To render something inert. Render it motionless. It, it would be a good word for if your car runs out of gas, just kind of coast to the curb and that's it. Or for a music box, you wind it all the way up and it gets to the end and it winds down and stops. That's the word he uses for death. And Christ had pulled the plug on death. He pulled the plug on death when he came as the Savior, when he lived a holy life for you, when he went to Calvary's cross and died for your sins, when he rose from the dead, when he came into your life, and he changed everything. Jesus Christ has rendered death dead and has now brought life and immortality to life and has changed everything. That's the motivation for Timothy to move forward with his family of faith. And that's our motivation as well. I'm going to encourage you to do the three things that Paul told Timothy to do. Fan your gift into flame. What is your gift? We could take a survey today. What's your gift? Do you know? Have you thought about it? Is it leadership? Is it cooking? Is it repair? Is it teaching? 
What, what is your gift? There are many that the church uses, many that you can use in your personal life to serve your neighbor. Fan your gift into flame. Don't be ashamed to speak. Sometimes we look back and we say, boy, I should have said something. I should have spoken up about what was right or wrong there, and I, I didn't. Sometimes we know we have to witness to that neighbor of ours. We fail to speak to him, fail, fail to speak to her, have that conversation with her. Sometimes we're ashamed. Don't be ashamed, Paul says. There's work to do through our church and also in your personal life to share the gospel. And then lastly, be willing to suffer. Yes, it's true. If we come, ridicule, persecution could come your way. In our country, we're kind of shielded from that. Other countries have to put up with that a lot more. But it could come your way. Be prepared and embrace it. I'm kind of reminded of the couple, the young couple in Oregon who just had to close their cake shop. That was big news up in Washington State in Oregon a while back. They wouldn't do a cake for a wedding. That was not a biblical marriage, we could say. Because of that, there is lawsuits, legal case, and they were fined $185,000 for not making a cake. Well, this last week, they officially closed their cake shop. They spoke up. They bore the cross. And they were not ashamed. They were willing to suffer. May we also, for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ and the message that he has given us, speak up as he gives us opportunities in our life. And when we have trouble doing that, think of the one who went before you who was not ashamed and who bore a cross and who willingly suffered. May we move forward together. Because in the end, it's a beautiful thing, family. Family of faith, a very beautiful thing. Oh, it can have its moments, it can have its interesting times, but it's a beautiful, blessed thing that God has bound us together in a family to be cherished. So look back with thankfulness in your family of faith and move forward together as a congregation here and also in your personal life as we share the gospel. Let our light shine and do the work that God puts in front of us to do. May God bless us as he blessed Paul and Timothy, Eunice and Lois and their family of faith. Amen. Please rise. <clears throat> May the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the true faith to life everlasting. Amen.